Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Oh shit. My lover gasped as he heard the footsteps coming up the steps. I thought you said your husband was out of town. I collapsed, laughing. His huge tool that I was so fond of shrank instantly. It almost looked like my husband's like that. Unlike his though, it would grow quite a bit bigger with the right encouragement. Don't panic, baby. The hubby is three states away, busy making money to keep me in the style I deserve. That's just Wilfred. Who the hell is Wilfred? He asked, watching the door closely. Wilfred is our ghost. He's harmless. I tell you about him, but I've got something else on my mind just now. I'll tell you when we're done. I dove down with enthusiasm, loving the way it felt as it grew to the point I almost couldn't keep it. He wasn't exactly gentle, ramming his monster into me quickly, but this wasn't our first go-round of the night. He screwed me through three orgasms before he blew. Despite it being the third time tonight, he felt like the same. We fell down on the bed together, and I rolled him on his back, and did what I called clean-up duties I lay back, resting my head on his stomach. Damn it all, if he was fifteen years older and had any money, my hubby would be history so fast archaeologists would have a hard time finding him. That was a lie. I loved my husband. At least I thought I did. These last few months had me rethinking that. How could I love someone and still cheat him so badly? Still working that out. But my boy Oi was in college and broke, pursuing an English degree. He had dreams of being a teacher. Lots of bucks there, I'm sure. Nope. He was just a sex toy, plain and simple. I'm sure sooner or later I'd get tired of him and his equipment. But I had a taste now, and I knew I would be on the prowl for a replacement as soon as he left. He toyed with my hair while I blew hot air across his tool, giggling when it twitched. I might just get another ride out of him tonight. Who the hell is Wilfred? This house is a hundred and five years old. Wilfred was the original owner. He built this monstrosity for his wife and the thirteen kids they ended up with. Unfortunately, his wife was screwing around on him, and she and her lover heard him coming up the steps on a night he was supposed to be out of town. Known for his bad temper, she panicked, grabbed a shotgun and blew his head off, just as he reached the top of the stairs. If you peel off the new wallpaper we installed a few years ago, you can still see the blood spatter on the original woodwork. One of the oldest children heard the noise and discovered them. His testimony led to them both getting hung. Wilfred's buried in the family graveyard at the top of the hill behind the house. No one really knows where they buried his wife or her lover. Right after that people started hearing the steps, but could never find anybody. So legend has it that Wilfred keeps climbing those stairs at the same time every night, hoping for a better ending. It's been documented for the last 93 years, and he's never hurt anybody. I keep forgetting how young he was. He listened like a kid at a campfire while the counselors told ghost stories. Doesn't it creep you out? I shrugged. It's creepy the first few times, but you get used to it. I hardly ever think about it anymore. He was actually company when hubby wasn't around, until I found you. Josh is Wilfred's great-grandson. He resembles Wilfred, especially when he sports facial hair. I don't like the way it feels, so I make him stay clean-shaven. Your husband must be a first-class chicken, the way you boss him around. I had to giggle again. The only thing big about Damien, yes, Damien, is his tool, sprouting out of a slender body, 5'9 and 145 pounds. I did a side-by-side -side comparison in my mind and giggled again. Josh was 6'1 and 205 pounds, very, very little of it fat. He's an excellent lover. If he just had few more inches, I would have never strayed. It would be very, very, very ugly if he ever found out. And at the very least, I'd be looking for a new home. He's not a chicken, honey. He's in fact a strong and virile man who could probably kill you without breaking a sweat. That's why I make absolutely sure he's never in the same state when we get together. He just does what I ask because he loves me. And trust me, if he doesn't want to do something, no force on earth can make him. But enough about him. Ready to go again? The next morning we showered together, going back to bed for another round. Then we went back to the shower, where I ended up blowing him. I swear, I think he was getting hard again when I gave him a hundred dollars for gas money and sent him back to the dorms. Hey. I wasn't paying him to screw me, but I was grateful, and college guys are always broke. I sighed as I stripped the bed. 
opening the windows to get the smell of sex out. I like the smell, but I doubt Josh would, especially since he didn't cause it. As usual after my lover left, I started feeling guilty. I should end it while I'm ahead and safe from discovery. Without a doubt, if he ever found out, the situation would end in D words. Divorce if I was lucky, death if I wasn't. I'd seen Josh lose his temper twice in his life, and neither time was pretty. The first time occurred about two years after we got married. We'd stopped at a light. There was a bus stop on that corner. It was pouring down rain, and three big guys were pushing a young girl out into the downpour, laughing like crazy. Josh was out of the car before I knew it. He helped the girl up, they'd pushed her down that time and she landed in a puddle. She was almost hysterical and Josh soothed her while the boys, late teens at least, continued to laugh. Miss, would you like us to take you home? Or at the very least to another bus stop? Or would you prefer we stay until your bus arrives? I'm sure these gentlemen, the sarcasm heavy in his voice as he said gentlemen, would be happy to share the cover with you. The young guys had obviously been drinking, and it made them brave. Go to hell a hole, before we have to teach you not to mess with the Hidden Valley Romeos. Josh actually laughed. What kind of name is that? It sounds like it would belong to a gay boy band. Is that it? You wanted to share a romantic interlude with each other and didn't want her to see it? Relax, being a queer isn't that bad these days. I'm sure your parents still love you. They were so stunned they didn't know what to say at first. Then the anger kicked in. One pulled a knife, and I cringed as it snapped open. You just screwed up, dickhead. You're gonna have to pay for that. Give me your money, and if it's not enough, we'll take it out and trade with your old lady. She looks hot. Josh had been standing there with a half grin on his face until he mentioned me. Before anyone could react, he slapped one. Bring his hand down instead of across. The pop extremely loud, blinding the man temporarily. Josh just kept moving, shooting a side kick out, dislocating the kneecap of a second, leaving only the guy with the knife. Take your best shot, boy. I'm gonna take that little blade away from you. Use it to whittle out your bum so I can get my hand inside. Then I'm going to jam it so far up you you'll taste the shit coming out of your throat. Now would be a good time to run. He'd taken off his jacket and had wrapped it around his arm. Then he started for the boy. Just before he got to him the boy threw down the blade and ran by him. Josh had timed it right, and just as he cleared the cover he got a tremendous kick in the bum. Blade Boy slid through a puddle, face down, getting soaked. He didn't look back for his friends as he ran away. They had gotten up and were hobbling away as fast as they could. He stepped in front of them, pointing at the girl. She has my name and number. One more repeat of the bullshit we just went through, and you'll never, ever make that mistake again, because you'll be dead. Now crawl back under your rock before a predator finds you and eats you for the worms you are. I was still shaking as we waited until the bus picked up the girl. Don't ever do anything like that again. You could have been killed. He actually laughed. There was a better chance of me being struck by lightning than those idiots hurting me. They were drunk and stupid. It didn't exactly make them dangerous, unless they would have pulled a gun. Curiosity got the better of me. What would you have done if they'd pulled a gun? There was no emotion at all in his voice as he adjusted the rearview mirror. Why? I'd have shot them, of course. I had forgotten because he never flashed it, but he had a concealed carry permit and always carried a pistol. He'd been in the army, and when he got out he spent four years in a private security outfit over there, saving every dime to start his company. To put it bluntly, he'd seen and learned a lot. I suddenly quit worrying. There was nothing he couldn't handle. It was just hard to reconcile the clean-shaven man in a crisp suit with the pictures I'd seen from his time over there, in dirty body armor holding a weapon, a scowl on his bearded face. I should have. But hey, he was just an administrator. He left the rough stuff to the professionals, or so he told me. The second time his anger came out was at a pool party the neighbors were having. I had on a pretty daring bikini. Hey, I was proud of my body. I worked really hard to get it to where it was. I'd had a few over my limit and was a little flirty, and a guest from out of the neighborhood got the wrong signal. When he got aggressive, I snapped at him. If you don't stop this shit right now, I'm going to scream for my husband, and he'll come over and screw you up. Back off. I must have gotten a little loud, because people were looking at us. It embarrassed him, and he lashed out. You 304. Rub up against me all day, lead me on, 
and when it comes time to prove up you want to scream for hubby, go to hell. He grabbed my top, yanking it off, laughing the whole time. Josh just seemed to appear, grabbing the guy and slinging him. We all heard the splash, but the women were trying to get me covered up, and the guys were ogling my jugs, so no one was paying attention to the pool until a woman screamed. Get him out. Quick, before he kills him. My jugs were instantly forgotten. The sight of Josh standing in about four feet of water, smiling, holding the man under as he thrashed and bubbled. It took three men to pull him off enough to let the a-hole breathe. The party was over. The only reason he didn't press charges when he could talk again was because if he did, I'd swear out warrants for sexual assault and assault and battery. It was a quiet ride home. We were almost there when I worked up the nerve to ask if would have really killed him. His answer sent chills up my spin. Yes. And Cora, I think it would be a good idea if you never wear that bikini again. It was in the trash the next day. I didn't mean for it to happen. Famous last words. I know. Josh had been gone two weeks, and I was getting a little stir-crazy sitting at home. Penny called me up, wanting to go out, have a few drinks, maybe dance a little. She was in the same boat I was. Her husband traveled, a lot more than Josh. I knew what she did, and warned her that sooner or later she was going to get caught. But she'd just laugh and say Henry was so in love with her if she ever did get caught. His forgiveness was a given. We'd socialized a few times with them, and I got the vibe that Henry wasn't the forgiving sort. Whatever though, it wasn't my life. Lately she developed the habit of driving to the next town over and cruising the bars that catered to college students. There was a pretty big university there, and to say the least, it was a target-rich environment. After making it clear, we were staying in town. I agreed to meet for dinner and a few drinks. I might have overdressed a bit, but I had been cooped up in the house and thought I might as well look good. I even wore my shortest skirt, with thigh highs and I was all set. We were to meet at a local hotel that had one of the best restaurants in the area. She smirked when I strolled in, looking me over. Which, if I had known, I'd have slut up a little more. I look like your mother compared to you. I took in the short red dress, the ton of cleavage she was showing, the yards of leg going down to four-inch heels. If she looked like my mom, I had a 304 for a mother. The meal was excellent, the bottle of wine we had making it even better. When it was over, I thanked her for getting me out of the house and prepared to leave. Oh no, missy, we're going into the bar and have a proper drink or two, and taking the beefcake. And don't worry, I'll play nice, and we'll leave alone. An hour and three really strong drinks later, I was feeling really good. The band started, and the gentleman started asking us to dance. Why not, I thought, it's just dancing in public. What harm could it be? We danced, most of the fast ones and all of the slow ones. I couldn't tell you how many boners rubbed against me, or how many times I had to remove hands from my bum. After two hours, it was just easier to let them stay there. There was a group of college students there. They looked so out of place I asked what they were doing. Penny laughed. Hunting. I was just buzzed enough to not understand. Hunting what? Penny laughed harder. Cougars. One man was getting persistent and a little too handsy. I tried to be polite, but he kept pushing. I finally told him I was waiting on my boyfriend, and he laughed. You've been in here two hours with your buddy. There is no boyfriend. Let's quit pretending, get a room, and do what you came here for. I slapped him. I didn't plan it, it just happened. The timing couldn't have been more perfect. The band had stopped, and the slap was pretty loud. Everyone looked, and a few laughed. He was beyond pissed and was reaching for me. I remember thinking it wasn't going to end well when three young men inserted themselves between us. The smallest stood in the middle, right in front of me. Apparently he was the leader. The other guys looked like football players, big and mean. No means no, a-hole. Run along now, I'm sure your mother is probably wondering where you are. Out past your bedtime and all. Go home and let her tuck you in. He looked like he wanted to argue but the guys just grinned at him, and he spotted management making their way over, so he left. They intercepted him, walking him to the door and wishing him a good night. He took the hint. My heroes, I said, giggling. I gave the two big guys a large kiss on the cheek, and the little one got one square on the lips. They started to leave, but I stopped them, ordering them around and insisting they sit with me. Penny, seeing the beefcake, 
dropped the guy she was chatting up and came back to the table. To shorten the story, the drinks flowed, the music played. I danced with all three, but the little guy got my attention. I felt it poking into me during a slow dance. As it continued to grow, I stepped back. He just laughed and steered me to the darkest part of the floor. When we were as private as possible, he took my hand and placed it on the front of his pants. I was drunk enough to stroke it a few times, thinking it couldn't possibly be real. In the meantime, he had his hand slid under my skirt, rubbing my bum, slipping his hand over my thong, before he slid a finger inside me, right there on the dance floor. It took all I had to remove his hand and lead him back to the table. Penny had a smirk on her face. She stood as I reached the table, handing me my purse. Time to go. I thought we were leaving, but she headed towards the elevators. Seems she had reserved a room while I was dancing. The boys went right along with us. Forty minutes later we were all naked. Penny was being double teamed by the big guys, and I was screaming as my boy toy was pleasing me as possible. Penny and the boys actually stopped and watched for a few minutes. When he slid almost all the way out her eyes went wide. I went in and out of consciousness, overcome by the feelings of pure lust. Something felt different, and I opened my eyes. One of the big guys was pounding me, while Penny was getting stuffed by my guy. They took turns screwing us for almost four hours, before they thanked us for a good time, and left. We were a screwed out mess, but I had never been so sexually sated in my life. Penny managed to stagger over, and flop into bed with me. I need to cuddle, she said, spooning up to me. I woke up five hours later, Penny wrapped up in my arms. I actually had her jugs in my hands. I separated from her slowly, hating the feeling. Then I went into the shower, turned the hot water on, and sat there, crying my eyes out. When I finally calmed down, I dressed and woke Penny. When she staggered out later, I had a pot of coffee on the table. She sat and sipped for a few moments, before she looked at me. Last night was a mistake, Penny. I don't blame you, well, not much anyway, but it can never, never happen again. I love my husband, and don't want to lose him. We're to never talk of this, understood? She nodded, obviously thinking. I agree, and he'll never hear anything from me. I rented the room, so there is no trail leading back to you. Tell your husband you went out with me for a few drinks, in case someone saw us. We ended up having too much to drink, and if he presses, tell him you spent the night here to avoid a drunk driving charge. I'll say this and then I'll shut up. I saw how much you got into it last night. Man, that boy was hung. You say you won't do anything like this again, but I know how big the temptation will be. If you decide to continue, be very careful. Call me if you need a cover story, and I'll ask the same favor from time to time. I wasn't really comfortable with that, but she kind of had me over a barrel. We did the walk of shame to our cars and our wrinkled clothing. I took another long shower when I got home and called Josh, desperate to hear his voice. He was happy to hear from me. I apologized for not talking to him last night, telling part of the truth that I'd had drinks with Penny and was a little buzzed when I got home and went right to sleep. There was a few seconds of silence. Cora, I won't presume to dictate who you're friends with, but I have a bad feeling about Penny and I've learned to trust my instincts. Watch out for her. I have a feeling she isn't the kind of friend you need. I felt a moment of blind panic. If he was that perceptive, how could I hide what I'd done from him? We talked about what we'd do when he come back. He was taking a week off. He suggested a little vacation somewhere warm. I was all for it, thinking it would be a good idea to get out of town for a while. When he came back the next week, I was really careful to be exactly the same as I'd always been, which was lucky because I always tried to destroy him with sex every time he was gone for a week or more. I worried I might feel a little loose, but it had been eight days, and apparently I felt the same. We went to the Bahamas for four days, and I got a really nice tan, especially my upper body, as the beach was designated topless. Josh always seemed to enjoy looking at my girls, and the fact that others were looking always turned him on a little bit. It's like waving a large steak in front of a starving man, then feeding him a peanut butter sandwich. They can look and lust, but I'm the only one that gets to touch. I flashed back, remembering three sets of hands fondling them, pulling and licking both jugs at the same time, and flushed. He thought he'd embarrassed me and apologized. Take me back to the room. I hissed, before burying my tongue in his ear. 
The girls need handled, right now? And Josh, they need a firm handling, understand? It was kind of embarrassing being on the beach the next couple of days, the bites and bruises on my jugs plain to see, as well as one on both cheeks of my bum, but it was worth it. For months went by before he had to travel again, this time for three weeks. I was bored by the second week, but determined to be a good girl when there was a knock at my door. Penny was there, with Brad, Bill, and Damien. My eyes went wide. Relax, honey. I just need to borrow your spare bedroom for a while. It's a lot safer than using a motel room. No trail. Why don't you take a drive or something? I promise I'll clean up when I'm done. She held my secrets, so I reluctantly agreed. Even took the drive she suggested, staying gone for two hours. They were still there when I returned. So I slipped into the kitchen and opened a bottle of wine. I was on my second glass when Damien walked in, naked, his huge tool swinging as he walked. Surprise! He grinned, then kissed me on the cheek before burying his head in the refrigerator, pulling a bottle of juice out. He poured a glass and sat beside me for a few minutes, making small talk, before he took my hand, guiding it down until it was wrapped around his. Twenty minutes later I was naked and bent over the sofa, while he pounded me from behind. From now on, you'll do this every time we're done. Understand? Then you'll thank me for screwing you. Got it? Brad wasn't Damien, but he still felt good. I believe I would have agreed to anything right then. Thank you, Damien, for making love to me. He grabbed my hair, giving it a yank. You're not listening. We don't make love. We had sex. And thank my tool, not me. The humiliation was turning me on. So between moans, I got it out. Thank you, mister for screwing me. I really enjoyed it. That must have pushed Brad over the edge, because he flooded me, blushing. I complied. I heard a noise and looked up. Bill and Penny were staring at me. I wondered where everyone went. God, Cora, what a 304 you've become. After that, I was totally hooked. Still, we were very, very careful. Penny had a minivan, and she would drive while the guys crouched down, not getting up until the garage door closed, even if it was dark. And I made sure I stopped playing at least three days before he came home, so I would feel normal. It had been almost a year, and we were beginning to get comfortable. Mistake. Big mistake. Now let's listen the story from Josh's perspective. The older I got the less I liked Halloween. I think it was because every time it rolled around, it reminded me that Cora and I were still childless. We were getting close to the window closing. She was 34 now, and it looked like it wasn't going to happen. One of the biggest reasons, besides really, really wanting to be a parent, that it sucked was because the house and farm was tied up in a perpetual trust. It went to the oldest son to the oldest son. The only exceptions were if a death occurred before children were conceived, or if they had no sons. Then it automatically went to the second oldest son, and then to his heirs. It looked like my nephew Bob was going to end up with it if things didn't change. The trust also voided community property rules, in case of divorce. The farm could never leave the family. My business had been growing steadily, and I was almost to the point of not having to travel. I was glad, because Cora always seemed a bit off every time I came home. In fact, the last few months she seemed to change. I'd catch her staring into space and smiling, and when I'd ask, she would say it was nothing and continue with what she was doing. In fact, this was my last long trip. I was working with a movie company, partly as a security consultant, partly as a weapons master. I'd become fascinated with guns thanks to my time with Mike and Harry. It took some doing, but I even had the AK-47 and the shotgun I'd used while I was overseas. I had so many weapons now I had to get a collector's permit. My two partners and I had a consulting company specializing in private security. I was the tech guy. They were the hands-on people, often providing short-term security personally. Mike and Harry looked kind of mean and scary so they had little problem escorting clients. I'm probably the only one in our company that knew that they really were mean and scary. Both had spent eight years in the military before the incident, as they called it. I never knew what it was, but rather than going through a bunch of unpleasantness, they were allowed to resign with full honors and benefits. They immediately went to work for the biggest private security outfit around, making five times what the government paid them. I got to know them by accident, a kind of right time, right place situation, and I helped them out of a jam. I was a tech geek, and they befriended me, 
making me work out with them until I was pretty proficient in a lot of things the military didn't exactly teach you. Most of my attitude in later life stemmed from my time with them. When my hitch was up, they talked me into working with them. I really had no prospects back home, and the money was fantastic. For the next four years, I spent large blocks of my time in sheer boredom and a few widely spaced short spans that seemed a lot longer at the time. In sheer, heart-stopping terror. You remember all the television shows and movies where the handsome leading men handled the real danger, while some geeky guy sat in a van or safe room somewhere watching monitors. That was me, the man in the van. I had no problem with that. It changed drastically one hot summer night, in a small city in a minor country. Some Middle Eastern princeling was being wined and dined by the locals, anxious for his money. There was a bit of dissent in the country over foreign investment, even if it was from people who looked and talked exactly like they did. I was in the van, watching the security cameras, parked in the back. Everything was going smoothly until a big truck pulled up and 12 guys got, dressed in black, wearing full body armor and helmets with face shields. When one popped the two sentries at the back door with a silenced weapon, I knew shit had hit the fan. I also knew, with light vests and just sidearms, Mike and Harry were dead meat. I was screaming into the headset as I bailed out, landing on my belly. The van was a rolling arsenal, and if you're not concerned with accuracy and just want to put a bunch of bullets in the air really fast, the AK-47 is just what you need. The boys had drilled it into my head a thousand times. Body armor and helmets mean you go for the legs. I was at the perfect angle and mowed down every one of them except a guy who was lucky enough to be standing behind the truck. He looked at his buddies, looked at me reloading, and got the hell out of Dodge. The second clip now seated. I emptied it, dropping the rifle and reaching into the van for my shotgun. Even with body armor, getting hit point blank with a magnum load of buckshot can ruin your day. It held ten in the tube and one in the chamber. A couple were in decent enough shape to shoot back. I felt something tug my sleeve as I targeted them first, walking forward on autopilot. Pump. Aim. Squeeze the trigger and pump again. I would have probably emptied it if Mike hadn't come out, both pistols in hand, the asset on his heels. He had just a second to take in the scene, screaming to get my attention. Josh. Josh. Execute asset removal. Now. Two minutes later I was rolling down the road, the asset lying in the floorboards. Ten blocks later we pulled into a garage, the door automatically closing. For minutes after that, a Mercedes limo with diplomatic plates drove sedately away, arriving at the closest border 90 minutes later. Two hours later the asset was in the bosom of his family, and our obligation was over. His father kissed me on both cheeks and swore eternal gratitude. If you want to thank us, give us a good reference. I think it would be best if I left now. In a nondescript little car, I drove to yet another country to find the guys waiting for me. They just stared at me before breaking into big grins and pounding my back so hard I had bruises. Damn it, boy. Where did that shit come from? You erupt into a full-blown scream in our headsets, then the bullets start popping. When you said a dozen, I kept waiting for the charge. We didn't look outside until we heard the shotgun booming. Shitfire. You looked like the Grim Reaper, walking through those bodies, stopping to shoot when you saw somebody twitch. If you want to know, you had seven instant kills, two more died within minutes. I'm sure the other two lived a very short, very painful time, until the authorities stopped thinking of things to ask them. You got the one who got away on your cameras. They're looking for him now. Mike paused, his smile vanishing. The bad news is the cameras also got your face as you slaughtered those hostels. Sooner or later, Someone is going to see that tape that's connected to those guys and want to do something about it. They also got me when I came out, so by association they got Harry. Looks like our time here is over. Time to get out of Dodge or end up in Boot Hill after dying in a particularly nasty way. Our bosses agreed, gave us a year's salary as a bonus and severance pay, and sent us packing. We got off the plane and were instantly flagged. Some nice boys from Homeland gave us a welcome home speech telling us we were on a watch list. The shit we did over there wouldn't come close to flying in the good old USA. We agreed totally, and they turned us loose. We went in three different directions, promising each other we'd stay in touch, each of knowing it was a lie. I was working in tech support ten months later, absolutely hating it, bored out of my mind. 
The guys I worked with knew I was in the army. The company I worked for was big on hiring vets. I told them the truth. I was never near combat, doing the same job I was doing here for Uncle Sam over there. They bought it, because it was the truth. I just didn't tell them about the four years as a private contractor. I was in a semi-serious relationship with another techie from my company. Beth and was a tiny thing, five feet even, with disproportionately large jugs and a wonderful smile. I didn't touch her for the first few dates, but on the sixth one she started rubbing all over me. I wasn't a rocket scientist, but I wasn't an idiot either, so two hours later a trail of clothes led from my living room to my bedroom. We got 30 days vacation each year in the security company, and the boys took me to France, introduced me to some friends of theirs, and disappeared. Three women, all very skilled in different things. I spent three weeks with them, and they taught me things. Lots and lots of things. So many that when Mike and Harry came back to get me, I dropped eight pounds. The education, and the $5,000, was worth it. I showed Beth a few things, until I got tired of hearing her scream and beg for less, than more. When I finally let her loose she lay crying. I thought I'd hurt her until she got her composure back. If you let me sleep a few hours, I want to do that again. So I did. She took two naps, getting woken in a very good way both times. She must have given me a good report, judging by the way her friends seemed suddenly interested in having conversations with me. Beth actually got jealous until I told her I was a serial monogamist. Then she'd just smile while they flirted, knowing it wasn't going anywhere. I was having serious thoughts about her, and then she screwed it up. We'd gone on assignment, two weeks on site at a factory. One of the guys on the floor noticed Beth Ann and started giving her attention. She rebuffed him gently, but he got more aggressive and she finally told him to stop or she'd tell his management. He said something really crude and she went straight to the plant manager and played the recording she had on her phone of the last two conversation. He was immediately fired and didn't take it well. I found out about it through the grapevine and was a little upset she hadn't told me. Oh honey, I didn't want you to get hurt. He's a 6'5 factory worker with huge muscles and a reputation as a fighter. You're pretty tall, but he probably outweighs you by 60 pounds, and after all, you are a computer geek. I was pissed and she could see it on my face. She tried to make nice, but her lack of respect signaled the beginning of the end for us. She got to see what a computer geek could do two nights later. We had finished the contract early and under budget, and management was treating us to drinks at the local pub as a thank you. The fired guy came in, saw us, and headed over. Everybody at the table tensed but me. He started out with his rant when I slapped the table. It made enough noise to make him stop. Why don't you go to hell? I'd said in the same tone most people would say good morning, and it took a minute for him to process it. By then I'd gotten up. He looked at my size and grinned, before ranting again. I let him run out of breath before I spoke again. What are you, twelve? Because you sure sound like it. In the interest of time management, why don't you shut the hell up so we can get straight to your bum kicking? People were listening, and someone actually laughed. Everyone at my table was watching, faces ranging from horrified, Beth and, to downright amusement, the company owner. With a roar the guy swung at me. I just leaned back into the side, letting the fist fly by. I grabbed his ear on the follow-through, twisting savagely and bringing him to his knees. He howled in pain. Here's what's gonna happen. I'm going to walk you out to the parking lot, where I hope you're stupid enough to try to fight again. I'll have a good time stomping your ass into a mud puddle. I tugged, and he had to follow if he wanted to keep his ear. I got him to the middle of the lot, where I let go, pushing him until he fell. I really hope you get up and come towards me. That was my girl you were harassing. I'd love to give you a lesson in manners. I was smiling, swaying back and forth. He could see my eyes and he didn't like what he saw there. Without a word, he stumbled to his truck. Well, that was disappointing. Nothing gets a woman's juices flowing more than having two alpha males fight over her, and Beth, Anne was no exception. She was all over me in the hotel. I was done with her, and decided to show her what she was gonna miss. I used every trick my French ladies taught me, reducing her to a quivering wreck four times that night. When we got home, I told her I wouldn't be seeing her anymore. She got very pissed when her arguments didn't work, went straight to the owner, who happened to be her great-uncle, and told him I was mean to her. He called me to his office, 
where I got a 20-minute lecture about how good I was going to treat his favorite great-niece if I wanted to stay employed. I politely thanked him for his time, went into my cubicle, and cleaned out my desk. I was gone in 15 minutes. I never saw any of them again except her great-uncle, who I ran into about a year later at a seminar we were both attending. He seemed very nervous, but I just grinned at him. In the after-seminar mixer, he worked the nerve up to approach me. How are you, Josh? I was doing great. We just launched our own business and already had enough work to keep us more than busy. Didn't tell him any of that, though. Just said I was doing fine. Uh, Josh, I just want to say I'm sorry for what happened. I was so used to dealing with people without spines I forgot there were actually men still in the world. If it's any consolation, if I could have found you before you disappeared, I would have told you to forget the whole conversation. I let my feelings for family override my business sense and lost what was one of the best employees I'd ever had. Is there any chance? I was shaking my head so he stopped. Well, I thought I'd at least try. Not that you need to know, but Beth and was a screaming witch for about two weeks before she finally realized you weren't coming back. It's just as well. She couldn't have dealt with a real man for long. She's living with a guy now, and I don't think he'll even go to the bathroom without her permission. Here's my card. If you're ever my way and need a job, look me up. I'll find a place for you. It didn't matter about Beth and, because by then I'd found Cora. She was attractive but conservative, in and out of bed. Still a pretty good lover, and I'd slip something new in every couple of months, expanding her horizon a bit. We married nine months later and moved into the family house. There wasn't a lot of opportunities in the area, so she became a housewife, filling up her time volunteering for different things and hanging out at the country club. They had a pretty good gym, and she played a lot of tennis, which kept her toned. I was glad to be almost off the road. Cora had seemed distracted lately. I'd catch her staring out into space, and sometimes she'd talk in her sleep. Once I heard her mumble, Thank you, Mr. Cock, and I asked her about it over breakfast. She choked on her coffee, and when she recovered, she told me Mr. Cock was on a committee with her and wasn't always pleasant. She saw me frown and hastened to assure me. Relax, honey. I can handle him. I privately call him Mr. Dick because that's what he acts like sometimes. We laughed, and I forgot about it. Now let's listen the story from Cora's perspective. I was getting out of control. As soon as I saw my husband off for a trip, and just as soon as I knew he arrived, I called Penny. Usually an hour later she'd show up, with the boys. Sometimes I kept Damien over, for a little one-on-one -on -one loving. It got pretty interesting this time, because Penny showed up with the boys, and another car with three more guys and a girl. They just need a bedroom, honey, they won't bother us. And they didn't, the first four hours or so. Damien had done me twice, the boys once each. I was just lying there in the afterglow. After that, we were off to the races. I experienced every combination of positions multiple times, including being made airtight three times. When he rammed that nasty thing, I bit the hell out of him. He fell off me screaming, blood actually dripping off his tool. I jumped up, pissed. Everyone out. I mean right now. They just laughed until I pulled the pistol out of the nightstand, thumbing the hammer back, jamming the barrel against the a-hole's balls. When the pistol came out there was panic, and my bedroom became a ghost town. Just me and Mr. A-hole. He looked like he was about to piss himself. I pulled back a little. Get your clothes, get your friends, and get the hell out. Forget the address. If I see you again, it will be real bad. The immediate danger over, he got arrogant. Screw you, witch. He held up his cell phone, laughing. I got it all right here. You'll keep screwing me and my friends, when we want, or hubby gets an email. In normal circumstances I wouldn't have done it, but I was beyond pissed. I pulled the trigger, and the phone went spinning out of his hand, the bullet going through a window. He dropped like a rock, convinced I'd shot him. I looked down. If you piss on my carpet, I'll blow your dick off. Now crawl your sorry bum out of here. I went through the house in a rage and threw them all out, including Penny. It took me two days to clean the house. I think every surface that could be used to have sex on was used, and they'd left stains. I had the window replaced. Thankful it wasn't a wall I'd hit. I was a SOSO shot. The fact that I hit the phone was sheer luck. I could just as easily blown his hand off. The thought scared me. It was the next weekend before Penny worked up the nerve to call me. 
I went right to the chase. Never, ever, bring anyone to my house again without permission. I didn't know those people, and while it was fun for a while, I never want to see them again. I think maybe we need to stay away from each other for a while. Things tend to get out of hand when we're together. I'll call you. A week later, I was walking around the house, raging. Josh had called me and said he'd had to extend his stay for another six days, which meant we'd miss the country club Halloween dance. I was pretty pissed. I had a witch's costume that was mostly transparent, and I'd planned to leave a lot of guys with blue balls before the night was over. Then I had a bright spot. A dozen roses arrived, from Damien. He said in the note he was sorry things got out of hand, but it really wasn't his or the boy's fault, and they all swore it would never happen again. I was in a mellow mood, and more than a little horny, so I called him, thanking him for the roses. We talked and decided to have our own little pre-Halloween party. I told him to be outside his dorm at 10 in the morning, and we'd get our costumes. He was almost dancing with excitement when he hopped in the car. What kind of costume are we gonna get? Depends, baby. How kinky you wanna get tonight? We ended up the next town over, in front of a line of sex shops. We'd been through three, making a few purchases. Happy Eyed made sure to load up on cash before I left. No way did I need an electronic trial. We were just about done, and we were in the largest shop when I had a wicked thought. I leaned over and whispered in his ear. Go in the back, baby, scope out the rooms. Find one with a glory hole, and I'll relieve a little of your tension before we get home. His eyes flew wide and he was off like a shot. I waited five minutes before going back. He was standing in the hall and nodded at the middle room. I slipped in, noticing the holes on both sides. In less than two minutes, a very large, very familiar tool poked through a hole. I scooted the rickety chair over, got comfortable, and gave him a ten-minute bee job that had him climbing the wall. He blew and pulled back, and I had my hand on the doorknob. When we were done, I slipped out, meeting Damien at the car. Where have you been? I was getting worried. I just shrugged. Things came up. Think we got all we need? He did. So we went home. Meanwhile, Josh, well, that was unfortunate. Not for me, but for the leading man. He was actually dumb enough to think he could do his own stunts, but the director kept a pretty close eye on things. He'd let him do small stuff, but made sure the stunt double was around for the serious stuff. He slipped behind the director's back and talked the second unit director into letting him try something that was really dangerous. It went jugs up, and he ended up with a broken arm. He was at the local ER and they'd put him out of action for five days. The director was beyond pissed, having to pay everyone for an extra week while they waited. He took the time to do rewrites to explain the broken arm and wait for him to get well enough to start shooting again. I spent the next day with the other actors, doing some gun battle scenes. You had to be really careful, even with blanks. There were some pretty good actors over the years that had managed to get killed with blanks, so safety was rule number one. I made sure I'd spend at least an hour with every actor, getting them familiar with the weapon they'd be using. I also kept a tracking form, and every round had to be accounted for. I was cleaning the weapons and packing them up when the word came down. Three days off. Most were really happy, because it meant they could spend Halloween with their families. I'd worked with a lot of the people on and off in the last few years. We fell into the business by accident. Mike and Harry did security for a well-known celebrity, and she happened to be interested in guns. Mike nagged me into talking to her, and when I showed her pictures of my weapons, she insisted I take her shooting. She put on old jeans, a sweatshirt, wore no makeup, and put her hair up in a ponytail. Gone was the glamorous movie star, the girl next door taking her place. I took four or five weapons I thought she'd like to shoot, and we had a ball. She would be a great shot if she practiced. I told her that, and she glowed. She really liked the eight-shot Rossi revolver the 22 being really easy to handle. She also liked the pump shotgun quite a bit. The range was part of a gun shop, and a week later she was back with permits, buying a 20-gauge shotgun and the revolver. The owner nearly freaked when he checked her ID. She was doing a movie 10 months later, and the weapons master they used had a bit of a drug problem. When one actor almost shot another, they fired him, and she suggested me as a replacement. I did it just for the novelty, but was good enough that I could probably do it full-time if I wanted. One of the many friends I made was Pippa, as she liked to be called a Brit of ethnic Chinese descent. She did makeup, specializing in face alteration. 
She could make anybody look like anybody or no creature known to man. She was only 5 feet tall and weighed 97 pounds, but they were really well-placed pounds. I caught a special effects guy roughing her up and gave him a lesson in how to treat a lady. I was her hero from then on. Cora for some reason hated Halloween, and she really hated horror movies. She said real life was scary enough. Why did you have to make up things that heightened the feeling? I, on the other hand, loved horror movies, and I'd seen enough while in the Middle East that very little shook me up. I jumped out of a closet once wearing a mask and grabbed her, meaning to yell B.O.O., -O, but she fainted dead away before I got the chance. Things were a little frosty around the house for a long time after that. I told Pippa once about Wilfred, and she was enthralled. I think she wanted to go home with me, just to hear him walk the steps. Cora had a little jealous streak, so I put her off. I'd showed her a picture of him once, and I saw her eyes gleam. She was going back to California to party with her friends, and I, of course, was going home. Looking back, it was a mistake, but she offered to make me look like Wilfred for Halloween. After he'd been shot, of course. We were doing a period piece, and Wardrobe had a suit from the proper era they let me borrow. I thought at the time it would be fun to scare the trick-or-treaters. The mask was kind of freaky, most of the face gone, skin hanging down in strips, one eye missing while the other glowed red, half the skull gone. It scared me when I put it on, and I was in it. She had me put it on a few times to make sure I could do it, and packed in a special case for me. I grinned on the way home, looking at the box. Those kids were gonna piss themselves when they got a load of me. Now let's listen the story from Cora's perspective. We'd experimented a little when we were by ourselves, and I found I liked to be dominated sometimes. We'd even experimented with bondage and breathing control. It was a rush to have your air slowly shut off as you screwed, having a monster orgasm as you lost consciousness. I'd bought us S&M outfits. I had a leather clincher that made my jug stick straight out, knee-high boots with a 5-inch heel, fishnet thigh highs, my hair back in an oiled ponytail, and really thick makeup on. Everything was black, of course. I got him some leather chaps, a leather vest, a collar, and matching tool ring. We also picked up a few pair of handcuffs, some lengths of rope, clamps, ball gags, dedos, and butt plugs. Damien got to be the dominant one first. He was so cute, trying to boss me around. I think he sensed my attitude, because when he whipped my bum and jugs with that flogger, he left stripes. They better be gone before hubby got back or I'd have to do some major league lying about how I got them. We rested, ate a light dinner, and then went back to the chamber. Tomorrow I'd be a good little housewife handing out candy, but tonight, I was a dom witch from hell. Damien would never be the same after I got done with him, meaning Josh. I drove down our winding driveway, wondering once again why Wilfred wanted to be so far from the road. The man must have really liked privacy. I looked at the box again, grinning. I was going to put it on before I went in, show it to Cora, since I'd be home after all, after we handed out candy, we could hit the country club dance. Maybe we'd win a prize this year. Pippa had given me another toy, a fake knife, an evil-looking bowie with a 12-inch blade. It had no edge, of course. The blade was actually two thin plates, with a 2-inch opening in the middle. The handle was filled with fake blood. All I had to do was squeeze, and it would pump out. It was surprising there were no lights on this early. The only light I could detect was from our bedroom. Maybe she had her scented candles going. Maybe she was enjoying herself. I'd caught her doing it twice. The first time she was embarrassed, but I pulled a chair up and made her finish. The next time, she ordered me not to touch her until she'd finished, and then hell out of her, that being her exact words. Wonder if she'd like to do it with Wilfred? Meanwhile, Cora. Damien would never be the same. I had his hands handcuffed above his head, his legs spread and tied to the posts. I pleased him with all different way. You're such a good little witch. Time for mama to have a good time. You don't mind, do you? I left the plug in, straddled him, and started my ride. We discovered zip ties, big ones, and we'd use them a few times for pleasure. I was doing some serious riding, almost there for the second time. I had the tie as tight around his throat as I dared, teasing him. I heard the footsteps on the stairs and cried out. Damn it, Wilfred. I'm a little busy here. I saw Damien's eyes widen, a look I'd never seen before on his face. I cried out, overloaded by the situation, 
and gushed like a river. Meanwhile, Josh was there. What the hell? I barely recognized Cora under the thick makeup, and I didn't recognize the boy under her at all. He looked like a teenager, a scared shitless teenager, looking at me in my mask and clothes, knife in hand. I didn't even think, running across the bedroom. She didn't know I was there, obviously in the throes of an orgasm. I yanked her head back by her ponytail, screamed out, cheating 304, and slid the knife across her throat, gripping the handle so tight the fake blood flew out and covered her chest. Hers eyes fluttered open and closed, and she fainted dead away, falling on the boy. His eyes were wide and he seemed to have trouble breathing. Cora must be a little heavy on him. Tough shit. When she slumped forward I saw the zip tie around his balls, reached down, and yanked it as tight as it would go. He arched up and tried to scream. I looked at them one more time, turned and left, sickened by the scene. I don't even remember getting into the car and driving away. Two hundred miles later I came to my senses. I'd driven back to the movie location, a state away. Since I already had a room reserved, I went back to the hotel and crashed. I was up by nine the next morning, planning the rest of my life. Cora was screwed. The house was in a trust, and the business was accepted by prenup. All she would get would be half the savings and checking, about fifteen grand all told. I was glad now we funneled most of our money back into the business. I'd let her keep the car. I never liked it anyway. Pippa was surprised to see me, but I told her I wanted to get some rest before I drove home. She asked if I had packed the mask. In my car, I grinned. Finally, I couldn't stall any longer. I hoped the witch had at least cleaned the bedroom. I'm pretty sure she pissed herself as she fainted. It looked like a cop convention when I came up my driveway. Three deputy cruisers, two plane sedans, a white van, and an ambulance. Had they gone crazy after I left? A guy in a suit met me at my car. Mr. Tompkins? Josh Tompkins? Yes, I'm Josh Tompkins. What the hell is going on here? Another suit had joined us. Mr. Tompkins, I'm William Smith, and this is my partner Alex Johnson. Could you tell us of your whereabouts for the last 24 hours? Gladly, just as soon as you tell me what's going on. Otherwise, you'll talk to lawyers. They looked at each other. I was scared to death they were going to charge me with assaulting the stupid witch in her toy. Maybe the a-hole lost his balls. Wouldn't that be a shame? Any reason you think you need a lawyer? I stood like I was thinking. Well, let's see. I've been away working for the last three weeks, and when I get home cops are everywhere, nobody wants to tell me what the hell is going on, and want to know where I was yesterday. So either tell me what the hell you're doing or I get enough lawyers here to start my own firm. They frowned. Apparently, they didn't like their authority threatened. Before they could respond, the sheriff walked up. These state boys bothering you, Josh? A little. Maybe you can tell me what's happened. He looked a little startled. You mean you've been talking with these guys for 15 minutes, and they haven't told you what we found in the house? They haven't told me shit. Now, sheriff, if I'm not detained, I'm going in my house. I started walking towards the door. One of them reached for me. Not a good idea. You touch me, and I'll enjoy spending your pension. I nodded to the side, and he looked, seeing the television vans for the first time. My property was posted, and they better than to drive up without permission. My closest neighbor, the resident busybody, had no problem letting them park in her drive. He pulled his hand back fast. I was almost to the door when a tall woman with striking gray hair, wearing an SBI jacket, stepped in front of me. Mr. Tompkins, I apologize for my associates. My name is Sarah, Captain Sarah Walters. If you'll give me a moment of your time, I need to talk to you. We moved closer to the van. Mr. Tompkins, the reason we don't want to let you in the house is that it's a possible crime scene. What kind of crime? Maybe none, but we still have to investigate. The reason we're here is that two bodies were found in your house. One, it saddens me to say, is your wife? Cora's dead? Are you sure? I'd killed the witch somehow. I ended up beside her van losing my breakfast. I'm sure my shock looked real, because it was. Well, there wasn't any identification on her, but we're pretty positive. After we get her to the morgue, you need to come down and identify her. After the mandated autopsy, if they find nothing unusual, she'll be released to you to make arrangements for interment or cremation. No, I want to see her now. 
The ambulance attendants had two sheeted bodies out of the house by then, ready for loading. Captain Walters nodded to one, and he pulled the sheet down a little. It was Cora, all right. In almost pancake makeup, the fake blood on her throat. I just nodded to her. She moved me back to the van. I saw blood. And why is she made up like that? It's fake blood, Mr. Tompkins. Apparently she and her companion were engaged in sexual behavior of a deviant nature. They were dressed in leather S&M outfits and had numerous sexual toys in play. Are you swingers, Mr. Tompkins? Do you enjoy a bondage and punishment lifestyle? What? No, we're pretty conservative people. Or I thought we were. Who was the other person? How did he die? It was a male, right? She looked at her notes. His name is Damien Phillips. 20 years old, a college student. And before you ask, he died of strangulation. It looks like your wife might have done it, accidentally, we suspect. Did you know the deceased? No, I've never heard the name before. What's going to happen now? Well, first, you need to find a place to stay until we clear the scene. I need to be able to contact you, so I'll need to know where you're going to be. I guess I'll go back to the job site. I still have a few days worth of things to do. Four or five days enough time. She said it was, but wasn't happy that my job site was 200 miles and one state away. Look, I'm a pretty respected person in my field, and I have to travel to satisfy the job requirements. You have the hotel number, my number, here. I'll give the the number for the production company I'm working with. I have a clean record, no arrests, no complaints. I own this farm outright. Do you really think I'm a flight risk? Just call, and I'll come. You seem remarkably calm, Mr. Tompkins. Doesn't the sudden death of your wife bother you? I was in the sandbox, Captain. Four years as a private contractor after I left the service. Of course I'm upset, but I haven't forgotten my training. So I'll hold on until I'm somewhere safe and private. Then I'll allow myself to process it and probably break down. Does that make you understand? She nodded, then slipped off her jacket and pushed up the sleeve of her shirt to show me the tattoo. Three tours, and I worked a year for what I bet is the same company before I came home. You're free to go, sir. We'll call you when we're done with our investigation. Everyone on the set knew something was off, but I didn't tell anyone except Mike and Harry. Bloody hell. She's dead? She was cheating on you? Which got what she deserved, if you ask me. Harry wasn't a real big fan of cheating wives. He'd been married four times. Three cheated on him and got caught and then he screwed up the last one by cheating on her. The divorce was uglier than usual, and with Harry, that's pretty ugly. Mike just shrugged. Sucks to be you right now. Sorry, brother. I still couldn't get over how clueless I was. Pippa told me much later it was because I was such a good guy that I thought everyone else was good also. I'm a lot more cynical now. Five days later I was in the state capitol, across a desk from Captain Sarah. She looked tired. We finished with the scene and your wife. I'm releasing her. You need to decide who picks her up. Her death has been ruled accidental. The autopsy revealed a hidden heart problem. A weak valve. That was fine until you put it under a lot of strain. We speculate the excitement of what she was doing caused it to rupture. I nodded. How did the boy die? I shouldn't tell you, but it will be common knowledge soon. Your wife strangled him. A zip tie? You know what a zip tie is? One was found around his neck. We suspect they were experimenting with sexual asphyxiation. When she had her heart attack, the strap was in her hand, and she must have tugged it on reflex. Judging by the scarring of the headboard, the bruising of his wrists and ankles, it most likely took him over half an hour to die. Hell, what a shitty way to go. The captain cleared her throat, like there was something sticking in it. Mr. Tompkins, when we did the autopsy, we found your wife had two different strains of STD in her. It looks like they were just past the incubation stage, but you need to get checked, and if you're positive you need to inform any partners you've had recently. I've only had one partner, I told her sadly, and it's been almost five weeks since I've had relations with her. I'll still hit the clinic this afternoon, just to be safe. Thank you for your time, Captain. I wished we'd met under better circumstances. She apologized once more, and I left. I buried Cora beside her parents in her hometown. I took a few minutes before the service, asking to be alone with her. I told her that I didn't mean to kill her. If I'd known about her heart, I'd never have done it. 
I also told her I'd have thrown her out on her bum for being a selfish, cheating 304, divorcing her as soon as possible, and telling everyone why. There wasn't a very big turnout. The story had hit and gone national. Her sex buddies had found her, and while they didn't leave a name when they called 911, the guy named Brad used his own phone. When they interviewed him, he spilled his guts. In all, 39 out of 63 people tested positive for at least one STD. I tested and was disease-free. Penny was thrown out on her bum and got little out of the divorce. Eight students were expelled for corrupt behavior and five professors were fired. There were seven divorces and six lawsuits. The college suffered a big blow to their image and enrollment was down for two years. I ended up marrying Pippa. Seems she still had a bit of a crush on me, but we didn't get together until after she married someone else and it cratered 14 months later. We became a two-person support group and still are today. Three kids, all girls, perfect little china dolls for daddy to dote on. We had all the kids while we were living at the old house, remodeling the top floor and making a new master bedroom. The room where the deaths occurred was officially a guest room, but in the seven years we lived there, it was never used. Halloween is one of our favorite holidays, and the house is full all that day while Pippa makes up the kids and all their friends. We've been disqualified from the country club costume contests, for obvious reasons. Pippa got her revenge by picking a different friend every year and going all out on her. Harry married her sister, making him my brother-in-law. He seems terrified of her, and she's smaller than Pippa. Mike married his movie star. She said it was cheaper to keep him up than pay him. Her biological clock had already struck midnight. So a year later, they adopted twin girls from China. You see her with Mike and the kids every once in a while on a fan show, drooling on the kids. It actually boosted her career, and she often plays a sexy soccer mom in family movies. When it became obvious I wasn't going to have a son, we honored the trust and gave the house and property to my nephew. When the house had to be destroyed, it opened a loophole into the trust, and we bought the farm back. Pippa, her sister, and Mike's wife are already planning the new house. I get absolutely no say on it, which doesn't bother me. I told her it didn't matter how the house looked as long as I got to live in it with her and the kids. Really good statement, judging from the loving I got that night. I think about Cora from time to time, wondering what would have happened if she hadn't become such a screaming 304. Pippa recognizes my look and makes sure she and the babies snuggle up to me, and I quickly put her out of my mind. Meaning the other entity, who is no longer in this world, and you know who she was? We stood at the top of the stairs, watching the bulldozer tear off most of the front of the house. Termites had gotten to it, and the county declared it unsafe, so it had to be raised. As soon as the top step is gone, so am I. I don't know how I know, but I do. In the last ten years, I'd learned to read him, and he had what passed for a smile on his ruined face. I think I'm going to miss him. What about us? Whined our third companion. If I'd known we were going to be ghosts, I'd have picked someone better to have been riding when I passed. I can still remember it, seeing the ruined face, feeling the blood flow as he slashed my throat. My last conscious thought on earth was that I thought blood was warmer. I was really pissed when I found out it was fake blood, but not nearly as pissed as I was when I realized I was dead. I remember him apologizing for killing me, but telling me if I was still alive I'd have been thrown out on my bum. I watched him bring that little witch in, crawling all over her every chance he got. I tried to remember if he ever screwed me with as much passion. She popped out three little replicas of her pretty fast, and it sickened me to watch the way they fawned over them. That's all I could do. Watch? I had no manifestations at all. I couldn't make noise, I couldn't move things. All I could do was just watch. Oddly, I don't remember Damien being such a winner. I'll tell you another thing. If I had known I was gonna die, I'd have dressed better. Then again, with the boots, the clincher, the hose, the heavy makeup, and the fake blood, I looked pretty good as a ghost. The rub was no one saw me, at all. I'd tried over the years, but it never happened. Damien just looked stupid. The zip tie around his neck, his blue face, the chaps, the vest, and collar on a pretty scrawny body. His ghost tool looked just as foolish, but then again, all we could do was look. We tried to touch in the past and just went through each other. So he whined. He whined about missing out on life. He whined about not getting to have sex ever again. 
He whined about what a stupid which I was for killing him. We'd get into some pretty big rows, then Wilfred would materialize and tell us to shut up. He was trying to haunt here. The dozer was inside the house by now. As the landing started to shake, Wilfred disappeared, and Damien whined. Hold my hand. Moron. How am I supposed to do that? I turned around, feeling the dozer blade go through me, praying to ever God I'd ever heard of to release me. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.